Good morning and God bless you. We're delighted to have you with us here this morning. Maybe this is your first time tuning in and joining us. We extend a warm welcome to you and trust you're blessed with what you hear today. We want to begin with prayer. Uh, we want to pray for our nation and our world. We also want to pray for Cornerstone Pentecostal Church. And uh, we're asking you to pray for your pastor and your congregation. We also want to pray for our brothers and sisters around the world. And lastly, we want to remember Sister Liz Parks and her children. If you would keep them in prayer, she lost her son yesterday morning, tragically, um, due to blood clots. We want to keep her and her children in prayer. Maybe you have a special and spoken request. This is a perfect time to make that known unto God. Let's pray together. Father, we love you, we praise you, and we worship you. We thank you for the abundance of all things. God, we pray for our nation and our world that is in oblique darkness, heavy darkness in this hour. Father, we pray for a great and effectual door of utterance opened up to the church of the living God. I also pray for Cornerstone Pentecostal Church. Pray that you'll open up the windows of heaven, pour out your blessing and your favor. I also pray for my brothers and sisters around the world. You furnish each and every one of them with a hedge of protection. And lastly, Sister Liz Parks and her children. Father, we pray that your everlasting arms would wrap around this family and be with them in a special measure of this time of uh, tragedy and loss. We ask all of this in the name above every name, the name of Jesus, and everybody said amen. I want to direct your attention to Matthew chapter number 13, and we are going to begin reading in verse number 24. Matthew chapter 13. Verse number 24, another parable put he forth unto them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Good seed in his field. But while men slept, while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tares also. So the servants of that householder came and said unto him, Sir, didst not thou sow good seed in thy field? From whence then hath it tares? He said unto them, An enemy hath done this. The servants said unto him, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay. This is what I want to focus on here, verse 29 and 30. But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, Gather ye together first the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them but gather the wheat into my barn. This is a familiar parable to all of us. But I want to talk to us about collateral damage. Collateral damage. Um, Matthew chapter 13 is unusual. Um, it, is, it is the chapter in the synoptic account, Matthew, Mark, and Luke that has parables, illustrations regarding the kingdom. It is unique in that sense. Matthew chapter number 13. Another unique feature of Matthew chapter number 13 is it is the only chapter where you have um, the word tares and it's used many times throughout this chapter, but it is found specifically in 
Matthew chapter number 13. So this parable is self-explanatory. Uh, a man goes forth and he is sowing good seed in his field while men slept. I am not going to spend a lot of time to explain that, but that is a natural function. While men slept. There's a lot that could probably be said about that, but nonetheless, at a time when there is there is a distraction that is taking place, the enemy takes advantage of the fact that men slept and sowed tares. So now you have wheat and now you have tares. They both come up. It's apparent what's, what's there. There's an understanding of how, um, how the tares got there, that an enemy has done this. The servants have the natural question, and it is a question that sounds very reasonable. Shall we go and gather up all the tares now? I mean, it just sounds, it sounds like a very common sense, obvious answer. We have worked hard to make sure that the wheat got out there. It's good ground, it's good seed, but now we have an admixture. Now there is wheat and tares together. But the landowner, the farmer, the pastor has the right response. And he said, let them grow together until harvest. Lest when you're pulling up the tares, that you pull up the wheat also. An, an incredible and extraordinary, an extraordinary wisdomic response, a response that is full of sagacity. And so, I'm looking at this, and I have been fascinated with this passage of Scripture, this parable, for many, many years. There is a lot in here for a pastor. There is a lot in here, really, for anybody. But for those that are in spiritual leadership, there's an a great example of wisdom here. Don't mess with the tares lest it damage the wheat and specifically the roots. Specifically the roots because while removing the faults with potential relationships, potential interaction, maybe there's people that, that that don't have the wherewithal, they have not come to the place yet through maturity or experience or even spiritual disciplines to be able to comprehend dealing with the tares. And what you're trying to avoid is collateral damage. And so the real question is, at what point do I deal with the tares. And so I want to offer just a few things about this. Um, some of this is comes from pastoring for a little over 30 years. There is a level of tolerance. And that is exactly what is being what is being implemented here is that the farmer the pastor is saying, no, let them grow together. We're, we're going to have to tolerate 
the presence of tares for the sake of the wheat. As long as there is not immorality, ongoing fornication or adultery or something of that nature that is that is ongoing, ladies and gentlemen. Um, outward manifested rebellion that parades in week after week and service after service. Um, blaspheme and railing against the ministry or the church or members of the church in particular. Um, subversive, um, false doctrine, people running around and saying, we, we really don't have to do this and do that and, and, and going against house rules, doctrine, um, the biblical stance of the church. Those are just four. There may be there may be a few more, but those there's four right there. There has to be a threshold for tolerance. And by that I mean that there is a limit to how much we're going to put up with before we deal with a tear. Now through through the years you can't, you, you have to be careful how you judge a tear. Um, I am told that a tear looks similar to wheat, except that when wheat becomes mature and laden with its fruitage, that as the wind moves across the wheat, that the wheat will bow and it will move with the wind, but a tear is straight. It will not move. It will not bow or bend with the moving of the wind. It's immovable. That's enough right there to, 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 uh, to draw the ire of spiritual leadership right there that is unmoving. But sometimes I've been, I have learned to just give some people some time. There has to be some self-control with this tolerance because sometimes it's not always determined exactly what the outcome will be. I heard the story one time years ago. There was a man that made the statement that we had a great revival and there was a lot of people that prayed through and... Um, there's a lot to process with a revival. There's a lot of pr to process with fish that are that are now uh, on the floorboard of the boat. And there's a lot to process with a harvest. And the statement that was ma was made after the harvest that we really need to go through some of these and make sure that we get rid of some of these and almost almost a boasting after a little while that well we were able to get rid of all of them and we're down at a healthy number now and i of course i'm not in agreement with that i believe that we should we should work diligently and 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 we should give everybody an opportunity uh instead of just getting rid of people that we don't agree with and don't like and whatever whatever reasoning is being employed there. You have to give people time. I have seen people that at one point they don't look, they are like they're going to amount to much and they're sitting there week in and week out. They don't come to the altar. They don't lift their hands. They don't have any demonstrative responses that get it and the light goes on and now they're in the altar and now they're lifting their hands and now they're interacting with God and now now they, they have received the Holy Ghost and they've been baptized in Jesus' name. You can't always, you cannot always call people 
tears that are not moving. Sometimes it just takes a little time. And this is, a lot of this is just, you, you can't make a one size fits all. Sometimes it's just a pastor has to operate on the level of wisdom and experience that God gives to him and does and does his best. But there are some times when that level of tolerance where you have to make a move. And I have found I have found that if one parent is going sideways and you're doing your best, I'm not just saying that you're doing everything you can to push people over the edge, but just it just happens. People spring leaks, people, people make choices, people go into the ditch, people, um, the enemy goes to work on people and if they're not praying and they're not, they're not grounded and they're not, they're not responding the right way, sometimes people can be turned. If one person in a family springs a leak, we're talking about a whole family here. I will do my best as long as you don't have those four things that I mentioned. But if both people become an Ananias and a Sapphira and they are both in that classification, I will go as far as I can keeping the children in mind. And that has biblical merit. You may remember that God sustained that generation. With many of them, God was not well pleased because they were overthrown in the wilderness. 1 Corinthians chapter number 10 gives a, gives a New Testament commentary on that. With many of them, God was not well pleased for they were overthrown in the wilderness. But God sustained them for the sake of the next generation that, of course, went into the promised land under the leadership of Joshua. But God sustained that generation. They were sustained but not blessed. And sometimes I will put up with some things because the children are in the altar and the children love God and the children want to be in Bible quizzing, and the children love the church, and, and, and the children, um, they, they're, they're connected, and they, they want to be a part of what God is doing, and you do your best to maneuver. But oftentimes, you have to pull out your ax and lay it to the root of the tree, or sometimes you have to pull out your sword, and you have to use it. But I do my very best as a pastor to avoid collateral damage. Sometimes um, when I was um, a new pastor and, and much younger and less experienced, that oftentimes at the very first sign of what looked like rebellion and disrespect and disobedience to the pastor immediately got pushback from me. I have learned, I have learned, I mean, these things are in degrees and everybody, every spiritual leader has got to, you know, make these types of determinations as long as it doesn't spread, as long as people are not vocalizing it, as long as da 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 Why? Because things are connected. Families get connected. People get connected with, with new converts and people get connected with brand new people and people get connected because of the culture of the church. And, and you have to, a pastor has to prayerfully navigate through all of these things because of the potentiality of collateral damage. I probably shouldn't say this, but I'm going to. Is that okay? I have learned to put up with a lot from people. Well, pastor, I would never put up with that. Well, that's why God sent me here and not you. I have seen a lot of people come to their senses and make things right and apologize 
and finally pray through. It might not be when I preach. It might be when an evangelist comes through. Through. It might come when we have a conference here. It might come blah, 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 blah. But I have found that God will bless me. for siding with mercy. Maybe I'm talking to somebody out there that is experiencing collateral damage. Maybe it's just that you got impatient. And, and listen, I don't want to say too much here because I don't want to sound like I'm being critical or, or judgmental about any decision-making process that anybody else has employed and, and felt to employ. I'm, I'm not here to do that. That's, that's not my role. That's not my place. I know from my own experiences that you're way better off by waiting and tolerating some things. Not open immorality. Not open rebellion. Parading rebellion in and parading rebellion out and influencing the youth group. No, 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 no. Not people that are railing and blaspheming and, but just giving God some elbow room and preach and teach, keeping my spirit right, being the servant of the Lord that does not strive, allowing God to work so that people can become free from the tentacles of the devil having come back to truth, correct thinking, and right perception, and praying back through, and collateral damage. As a pastor, um, as I look over the last 30 years of um, a home missions pastor, I've learned some hard lessons. I've learned some hard lessons, and there's some things that could have been avoided. I hope this has been a blessing to somebody. Pray for your pastor. Do you know what spiritual leadership is going through in the 21st century? We need God's wisdom. We, we have to have the, the gifts of the Spirit in operation. I'm not talking about hooky spooky stuff. I'm not talking about charismatic soup. I'm talking about apostolic empowerment and enablement. We've got to have it. You cannot build an apostolic church without it. So pray for your pastor and pray for your congregation. God bless you. Thank you for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you on Monday in Jesus.